Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Dieter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. If you're listening to this on your iPhone or on your computer at home as a podcast, well, you can't see me, but guess what? Uh, if you want to, the next time you can go to my YouTube channel and you can see the video podcast uh, version of this, which is all you folks out there in the uh, YouTube world that are watching. The bottom line is I've got the regular podcast audio version and I've got a video version. So uh, doing some stuff a little bit different. Throwing this into the mix on YouTube for some folks that are not into the podcasting world. And... Uh, but still putting out the podcast for all you guys that like to listen to it on your phone or on your computer in your spare time. Uh, I did my first one last week. This week, I decided to bring a guest on. Uh, kind of put this one together at the last minute. So uh, the video version of it is not ideal. We did this one via Skype. And uh, I kind of wanted to bring the, uh, I guess you'd call him the godfather of catfishing YouTube on here. And uh, that's Lyle Stokes. Uh, he is the host of Catfish Weekly, uh, which to my knowledge is the longest running catfishing, live catfishing show on YouTube. Uh, he's been doing that for many years now. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about how he got started, uh, you know, with the show, uh, where he's progressed to, where he's at now, and kind of what the future plans are for the show down the road. If you haven't checked it out, uh, the show comes on every Monday night. And uh, it's at 8 o'clock, and it's on YouTube, Catfish Weekly. Uh, I asked Lyle during uh, the, the podcast, you'll hear this later, how many days he's missed in all these years. I think he said he's been doing the show for eight years. You'll be shocked how many days he has missed. It's an amazingly low number but uh he was getting ready to go out of town to uh, uh host uh, a tournament uh or not host a tournament but uh actually i think mc a tournament so we had that going on so we kind of threw this one together last minute uh the video end of it isn't as perfect as i like it or as i want it to be so uh but i also wanted to get lyle on camera uh as one of my first guests because he is the guy that gave me my first break when i started my youtube channel uh, he asked me to be on the show. I'm not even sure where he got my name from or, or found out about me. So uh, I figured this is my little time to pay something back to him. And uh, he's helped a lot of people over the years. And I think by the end of the show, uh, you'll understand what a great guy he is and why I wanted to put him on here. So uh, we'll get on the show, get on the road with the show. Lyle Stokes from Catfish Weekly. Well, I guess first, let's go back to the good old days. What is the first fish that you remember catching? Uh, channel catfish out of a pond. Where were you? I was in a, a pond behind our house, but there was an experience before that that you might find interesting. Um, my mother and my brother used to go fishing in that pond, and I was too little to fish, or so they thought. Uh, and I kept playing in the water while they was catching bluegill and catfish. And I wouldn't stay out of the way. And after mom paddled my butt, she tied me to the gate post. And I stood there and watched them fish all afternoon. And you only do that one time and you quit playing in the water in front of my mother. <laughs> now, where was this at? Where did you grow up at? I grew up out in the first place I remember living. Uh, it was a little small house a dad farmed i think 400 acres um out, just right outside of bowling green missouri about two miles out uh, off of highway in and um, i think he farmed that you know with two bottom plows and um an old ford tractor of some kind i mean it was that was in in the early 1960s now was that I mean, were you into fishing from then on, or was that just something like a lot of us that you did kind of now and then? No, I fished most of the time from, from that point on. My brother, um, my dad died when I was pretty young, and, and my brother was always there, and he'd go fishing, and he'd come by and pick me up and take me along with him, uh, and other things that he did, but fishing was one of the, 
the mainstays and he he bought a boat um i was about 15 or 16 years old it was a 25 horse elgin a uh, little narrow v bottom and uh we'd go take it down the mississippi river and catch big old carp and catfish out of the mississippi river below the carpsville dam uh, yeah. this was in the 1970s but uh my friends and I, when we grew up in, in school, we would ride our bicycles out to a couple of ponds that we knew where was at, that people would let us fish. And we'd spend evenings after school and weekends catching those fish. Now, you said your father passed away when you were young. Mine did, too. I heard you say that in, a, uh, I think, one of your live shows one time. How old were you when that happened? I was 15. Okay, I was nine, almost ten when that happened. How mm -hmm. much older was your brother? Because coincidentally, my brother played a big part in my life early on. He was kind of, until my mom met, you know, someone else, my stepdad that I grew up with, he was kind of the, I guess you could call it, father figure to a certain extent. He was older than me. How old was your brother? My brother's nine years older than me. If In those days, um, he had a 428 Super Cobra Jet. When he'd go out racing around, he'd come get me. If his buddies was doing it and he was riding with them, they'd come get me. That's yeah. how I got started in the automotive industry. And if we wasn't doing that, we was fishing uh, yeah. or hunting. He took me rabbit hunting a lot. Uh, but, yeah, he was, from that point on in my life, he was not only my my brother and my best friend, uh, he was like a dad to me, and he always took care of uh, things that I needed that, you know, a mother really can't do and, uh, he's just always there. Yeah. Now, what's the town like you grew up in? Uh, I, it sounds like a smaller <laughs> city. Tell me about that area. 3,500 people, the best I remember. Now, it's got around 6,000 now, I think, but they've got a prison system that uh, built a new prison there, so they'd employed a lot of people and brought them in. But um, it was kind of uh, who you are is what you are, mostly a farming community. In those days, everybody had... A whole bunch of pigs they was raising all the time, a few cattle once in a while, but row crop, uh, lots of row crop, corn, soybeans, wheat, stuff like that. <clears throat> now, what did you get into your, your first job? You mentioned mechanic work. Was that one of the first things you got into? That was one of the first things. I was When, uh, when I was very young, Mark raced stock cars, and he had a friend of his that was one of the top mechanics or in the area uh built race car motors we worked at a ford dealership and i would when i 12 13 years old i was at his house nearly every night helping him work on cars that's how i got my start okay and later on i become service manager for the five division gm shop a big ford dealership in texas and and uh, then later on uh my own business for 20 some odd years now at during that time period, uh, you're a young man starting to make your way in the world. Uh, where were you at with fishing? Uh, was it on the back burner then, or was it still something that filled up your free time? Believe it or not, Dieter, I, I tried my hand at bass and crappie tournaments. It was so political in those days, I was not comfortable doing it. That was one of the reasons that I, t not only did I like catching the catfish, it wasn't as political. But as soon as it got bigger, it's far worse political now than the bass and crappie was in those days. But um, one of the one of the things I was service manager at a GM dealership, and we was uh, like eight or nine miles from Bennett Springs Park, and uh, that's a big ha trout hatchery, and uh, we'd go down there and catch them rainbow trouts. Before work, sometimes uh, weekends, people would come down and visit with us, and we'd go down there. And we'd done that for several years. And uh, my brother in law and I uh, did that a lot. And we got to where we'd just walk up and down the banks and target them fish. Yeah. And that's how I got started in the rod business. Now, well, back to the fishing and what you were figuring out then. Uh, when did catfish start to show up on your radar as something to pursue? Was that in that time period or was that later on down the road? No, I always did. We still went catfishing all the time. Uh, when catfishing become a big deal to me was later on when I found out that they had catfish tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, 
and those was U.S. Cat tournaments. At the time, they was the biggest stuff around. Um, we fished a lot of their tournaments. My son and I, uh, when he was uh, not old enough to drive, uh, you know, two-man tournaments, which is what it should have stayed at. Mm -hmm. uh, two-man tournaments, uh, and it didn't matter if you had a kid, he was your partner. And that's who I fished with was my kids. They yeah. was my partners. Uh, I don't know if they appreciated it much, but it made me feel good to take them and beat some of the guys that was, uh, we, we had a good success rate on those U.S. cat tournaments. That's where I got to know Doc Lang and a bunch of them guys. Now, what was the draw at that point to catfish tournaments? Was it the challenge, trying to prove yourself, the gambling aspect, making some money? What was the, at that point when you were doing tournaments? What was the draw? The draw for me was trying to learn from some of the other guys how they consistently caught the bigger fish. We could always seem to go out and catch five small fish because that's what the limit was on all the tournaments in those days. But I couldn't consistently put the larger fish in the boat. And let's face it, if somebody's, you go to a tournament, somebody's going to find them. So it might as well be you. And that when we started doing that, we had uh, the little round depth finders. It, we didn't have depth finders like we got today. You had the old sounders that would, you right. had to be able to distinguish between the big pulse right. and stuff and <laughs> figure out what And then they come out with paper graphs and we thought, oh my God, look what we got. <laughs> what will they think of next? Yeah. <laughs> now, what was the, you know, a lot of people, there's going to be a younger crowd listening to this. What was the tackle like back then that you were using? Compared to what is on the market today. It was very poor, but at the time we thought it was the best stuff in the world. And what a lot of us got to do, and if we was fishing the big rivers, was we would go out and find offshore stuff. And you, it was hard to find being in Midwest. I mean, we're in the central part of the United States. There's no ocean mm -hmm. stuff around. But if we right. could find those, we used them to fish. A lot of them with solid fiberglass rods. And a lot of the guys that used I used to fish with back in them days are big spoon billers now, and they still use those rods with the wooden handles to catch spoon bill with. They snag with them still. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. Ocean City. Yeah. Now, was part of that lack of good gear the reason you started building rods? No. The reason I started building rods is when we was we was catching, I was fishing a few of those bass tournaments, and I could not, for the life of me, find a rod that would do what the company said it would do, for one, and do what I wanted it to do, for two. So uh, we was down there catching trout one day, and there was a well-known uh, guy down there to build fly rods, and he's still doing it today. And I know there's a lot of big names in the industry, but Charlie Redding is by far, heads and tails, the best that ever built a rod. Hmm. And uh, he didn't have time to build one. He built me a fly rod. Uh, and we're talking about 1970s, and I paid $750 for this fly rod. It was, that's a ton of money. Wow. That is and, a ton of uh, money. That's a ton of money now. Uh, yeah, but it was a, a lot it's, then. <laughs> it's a heavier ton then. Yeah, yeah exactly. He, um, I wanted him to build me a bass rod. And he said, there's no way. He said, I'd be two, three years to, before I could even start on it. He's, and he's still like that. He said, I'll order the stuff and tell you exactly how to do it. He said, it's not hard. It's just time consuming. And I've told a million people that. That's, that's exactly what it is. And it turned out pretty good. And then I built a fly rod and give it to my brother. And the next thing you know, we was fishing them catfish tournaments. And I was building them. People got to look at them. Well, can you build me one? And that's how that took off. Yeah. Uh, in the tournament world, the catfish tournament world, you're in it a ways back. Uh, when was the... There's been a lot of evolutions and changes. When was the first kind of change that you saw taking place in tournaments and what was it um the catching of bigger fish because when we first started catching or doing tournaments i can remember 
having a tournament in Louisiana, Missouri on the Mississippi River. And every, when they'd take off, there was only 10 or 15 boats. And they'd shoot a gun up in the air. You know, nobody knew any better <laughs> those days. And we'd race down to the granary. And everybody would sit there where these loading barges and try to catch the five biggest channel cat. And then yeah. all of a sudden, they decided that you could go 11 miles and get behind the Clarksville Dam when the conditions was just right, and you could catch big fish all day if you had good bait. And in those days, what we considered good bait was shad. That was nobody, or if they knew anything about skipjack and uh, baits like that in those days, they wasn't telling anybody. Because yeah. I never heard of it till several years later. And once I found that there was moon eye in that river, it was over with the shad for me. Yeah. Now, at that time, what was, uh, do you remember what the world record was then? Because I can remember back when the world record blue catfish had barely, br it was below 120 pounds. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Do you remember what it was, Dan, when you were when you were? Fishing? I'm not a hundred percent, Dieter, but I think it was 93 pounds, and that was one caught on a trot line. That is amazing that it's a sub 100 pound fish with this, yeah. you know, with where it's at now and as many. Yeah. When when did you start seeing not hundred pound fish, but 30, 40, 50 pound fish showing up in tournaments? Um, I'm going to say it was probably the late 1980s. Okay. Uh, and you'd see one every once in a while before then. But in the late 1980s, early 1990s, you would see them become more prevalent. You'd see more and more of them. And then it got to be where, um, you know, it would take 60 or 80 pounds to win a tournament, any tournament. And then pretty soon it had to be 70, and then it had to be 80. And, and then are, you a, are you talking five fish? In five fish, yeah, yeah. Five yeah. fish. And then pretty soon the weights was getting so big that people started cutting them back to three fish limits on a lot of the tournaments on the big rivers. Because if you hit a day below any one of them dams on the Mississippi River, you could catch three or four 60-plus pound fish. Uh, nobody, nobody in those days had live wells to keep those fish alive. Just yeah. didn't. Yeah. Did, uh, when that started to happen, uh, was it wide? Were you seeing this in a lot of places around the country? Or was this just like happening on the Mississippi River, or the Missouri River, or Ohio River, some of the big fish fisheries? Well, Dieter, in those days, we didn't have the internet like we have it now. So I think it was happening all over, but you wasn't hearing about it till months later because you'd see uh, Harold Dodd at, at a tournament, and he'd tell you about some guy that caught a 70 or an 80-pound fish, and then you'd see somebody else, Jeff Dodd, uh, at another tournament later on in that year, and he'd be talking about a guy caught a 100-pound fish. And everybody's going, yeah, right, they caught that on a rod and reel, no way. But <laughs> nobody really believed that they was catching those big fish all the time. And then we got to catching them below the dams um, and catching more than one at a time. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that became uh, a very big deal. And then we got the fishing deeper holes in the in the waterways that we never thought you could catch fish out of you know yeah well, well you mentioned uh the internet technology uh, when and i know you from back in the catfish one the uh <laughs> yeah. days way back when when it was chat groups and right. forums as they were called online uh when did you first start seeing that start to show up? I remember that had to be late 90s, early 2000s. I don't remember exactly the timeline. When did you first start noticing that it stuff? Was in the, it, was in the, it was in the mid to late 90s. I don't exactly remember. When I first joined Catfish 1, it only had 600 and some members. Yeah. And I, I got booted from there a time or two, and every time that I would come back in, 
there would be substantial numbers of increased members. And the okay. last time I knew it was what, 80 or 90,000? Yeah. Something yeah. like it, that before it was sold. It had a huge following. And I think that I can, can honestly say that contributed to this more sharing of information about how to catch catfish than any one thing that I can think That's of. That's what I was going to ask you if you, you feel that that part of technology kind of accelerated the spread and desire for people to go chase catfish. Yes, I think so. Um, and, you know, that's where we first heard of Steve Douglas. You know, uh, nobody knew where Steve Douglas was or his rod holders until he was on there. He done really good on that website, but um, there was a lot of guys like Steve. What was the guy that originally, Jeremy, um, the original guy that owned uh, Tangle and Catfish Rods? I, I don't Jeremy, remember the name. His first name was Jeremy. His, his partner's name was Beecher Wolf. I can't remember yeah. his last name. He's from Indiana, and he they was going all around in tournaments over in that area. And that at that time, selling fishing rods and winning nearly every tournament they went to. And his name traveled throughout the industry really quick. And then when all of a sudden they decided they was going to do bow and arrow target shooting, and uh, they sold the tangle with catfish rod business, and nobody's ever heard of him since. Wow. Now, at that time, still, uh, the as far as equipment goes, you look around now, there's uh, there's at least a dozen different catfish rods that are high, you know, high quality rods. Yes. Yes. How many were around then that, you know, I mean, we had the ugly stick catfish rod from Shakespeare, and sure. that was about the only thing that had a catfish picture and a name on it. There wasn't a whole lot around back then that was designed no. for the catfish industry. No, there wasn't. And um, there was an original guy that sold rods, custom rods, on Catfish One from down in the state of Louisiana. I can't, can't remember his name. Done a really good job. And I talked to him one time because he was needing some stuff and he couldn't get supplies. Everybody was out or whatever it was. He, he, he called me to see if I had it because he knew I built a lot of rods and i didn't uh but we talked for a little bit he said man he said i'm glad to see somebody else building catfish rods he said i get off work and i build rods till one two three o'clock in the morning i get up at six and get ready to go to work he said i do that every day and all day every weekend and he was way behind all the time and which was the downfall of me taking the fun out of it you just get so busy that people get mad because you can't get them done fast enough. And when that starts happening, it ceases to be entertaining. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. Now, <clears throat> fast forward a few years with more technology. One of the things that the owner of Catfish One predicted, I remember Paul saying, he said, Facebook will be the death of his website. And at the time, at least I didn't really get what Facebook was. I'd heard of it, but I think it was right in my mind with my space and some other stuff exactly yeah but once it took off got some traction it it really became a real clearing house and a lot of different you know we had one or two three catfish websites forums and now there's a hundred two hundred different catfish places on facebook how it what's been your opinion on that and how that's affected the sport both positively and negatively well um there's a lot there's way too much drama on facebook period uh doesn't matter if it's people just fishing individually and other people saying oh that fish didn't weigh what you said it did or somebody arguing about a tournament results or or whatever happened at some tournament or just guys visiting they'll start up stuff and the drama is terrible for our sport but on the positive side, you can find out where there's a tournament close to you, where there's a big tournament, what the entry fee, everything is available to you by just a search uh, online. And you can come up with it. And if you don't know, there's somebody in your circle of friends that will know 
what it is that you're looking for and how to find it. Uh, one of my favorite things about Facebook is there's a small group of guys that I'm in chat with several nights a week for several hours at a time, and we discuss business stuff, fishing stuff, um, crazy crap that we shouldn't be talking about. But I consider them some of my very closest friends uh, because it is just, like I say, something that happens four or five nights a week. Yeah. So that's good. Now, and you get to find out people you went to school with you may not have seen for 40 years. Yeah. Do you think the good in social media outweighs the bad when it comes to fishing, at least? Uh, there, in any, like you said, anywhere there's going to be drama, uh, it's going to happen. I think it's just part, part of modern culture. But do you think the good outweighs the bad in what we can do out there in the fishing community? Some days I think yes, and other days I say, think no. I see what some of these guys are doing that knows nothing about any kind of fishing, much less catfishing. Uh, and I think, my God, what's, what's going to happen to our industry? And then I see somebody like, for example, Hagen Grubb. Hagen Grubb hit the scene of running. He's extremely likable, him and his son Landon. I just got done watching a video of his. He's a hoot to be around on the on if you talk to him on a phone or if you meet him someplace. He's an excellent fisherman and he does a quality job making videos. And the guy ain't been doing it very long. Right. So and he's that, a he's awesome. a tar, he's he's a target for this podcast as soon as I get a break <laughs> and can get up there to him because uh, yeah it's uh in my opinion I I again there's the good and the bad I think the good. And maybe that's just the optimist in me. I just feel the good has more potential to outweigh the bad. And it's part of the reason I have my channel and do what I do is that I think you can influence enough people. You can influence more people with good than you can with the bad. And, you know, that's the thing I think I like about your show Catfish Weekly is that, you know, it pretty much avoids, you know, the drama. You know, there may be some talk about a weigh-in or something that went on somewhere, you know, but it's pretty much stayed out of all that fray for the most part. Well, we try to, and uh, I have a no drama policy. If someone comes on there and starts stirring the pot, so to speak, they don't last long. And I, I have probably written rules. I'm going to guess for 90% of the catfish tournament trails across the United States. Yeah. I've sent them to everybody that you can think of. So, and sometimes they amend them, and that's good. I give them a general idea of what it takes to run a quality tournament, and what they do with it from that point on is up to them. But um, I see those guys look at them and amend them, and I'm thinking, yeah, this guy's got it going on. He knows what it's going to do. But the number one thing I tell them is no drama. You cannot allow drama at your tournament weigh-in. You can't allow it on your website. You're just asking for trouble. Those kind of people you don't need, and there's no sense of putting up with it. Yep. Let's go back to Catfish Weekly for a second. And yep. I, I want you to go back to when you – and think about when you first had this idea to do this. People. out there how did that conversation idea come up and how did you go from there to getting that first show on the air i'll tell you exactly how it happened paul ragsdale and i was doing several little projects together and paul called me up one day and he said hey i'm doing a radio broadcast i would like for you to be a guest i said what are you talking about ray he said i do a radio thing on youtube I said, okay. So he called me up. We did this over the phone, um, or th I guess through YouTube, because I had to go out and buy my first um, deal to, to, to do. And, and what, uh, year, what year was this? Oh. Eight years ago? Okay. okay. So what would that be? What is this? Uh, that's 2021, 2000, so. 2012, somewhere along in there. Okay, okay. So, so roughly, 
So we done this thing and, and we got done with it. And, and Paul says, how do you think that went? I said, Paul, I think it went fine. I said, but if you could figure out a way to do that live and broadcast it with both of our images on a screen, it'd be a hit. Yeah. And that was on a Sunday night. And on Wednesday, he called me. He said, I've got it. Go buy a webcam. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and Sunday night of that week was the very first Catfish Weekly uh, with Paul Ragsdale, myself, a gentleman from out your area, Brian Lanham. Um, he used to be a wrestler or something, big boy. And um, Chuck Davidson. So no, Chuck come later. Chuck come about two shows later. So was that the original title of the show, Catfish Weekly? That was Weekly? the original title of Catfish Weekly. Because yeah. that sounds to me like you had a little bit of a bigger plan here to continue right. to do this. Well, I don't think anybody but me did have, because I could see in the future, if this worked, this would be a great way to teach people how to catch more fish. And that was always my idea. And um, as time went on, we, we, we got Chuck in there, and then we got Chris in there, and Brian went away. Um, all of a sudden, Paul had some really serious health issues. And he called me one day, and he said, man, I, I'd like to sell my third. It was three owners. It was uh, Chris, me, and Paul. And Paul said, I want to sell my third of Catfish Weekly. I said, uh, what do you want for it? He told me, I called Chris. I said, Chris, I, I would offer you half of this and you and I will be 50% owners. And he didn't want to do it. So I said, okay, no problem. I sent Paul a check and uh, I own two thirds of it. And he owned one third of it. And from that point on, him and I had a few issues. We get along and do shows together, but we didn't agree on too much stuff. And and some of the things that we didn't agree on was the future of the show. So one day I just said, hey, you know, either you're going to have to buy me or I'm going to have to buy you. And he said, well, I don't want to sell. I said, well, then you buy me. And he wouldn't do that. So I said, tell me what you want. He did. I wrote him a check. And that was the end of all the arguments. Uh, there was no, no counterfeit. And I love old Chris. I really do. We would visit at, at Monsters on uh, Ohio. And, and have great fun. Uh, I thought he was a super guy. Tried to get him and had him back on the show a time or so. Uh, would like to have him back again sometime. But he just didn't like the fact that uh, of where I was wanting to go with the show and what he was doing with it, I didn't like. So um, this just worked out to the better. I think it did. In all those years, how many shows have you missed? Because it seems like it is about as consistent a weekly show as I have ever seen on the internet, much less in the fishing community. It's a little bit easier, I think, nowadays. But with the run you had, how many have you missed over the years? It doesn't seem like many. Five, I believe. That is amazing. It is. Absolutely. I'm I'm not sure, but I think it was you that told me the key to... Um, making a great YouTube channel is consistency. If you're yeah. supposed to be there on a Monday night, be there on a Monday night. And there are a lot of people, myself included, <clears throat> that that is just instinct in our minds that whatever you're doing, you get done with work, you get home. Oh, it's Monday night, eight o'clock, you know, Catfish Weekly's on. I'm going to jump on and jump in for a minute and <laughs> You know, maybe you stay for the whole show, depending on what you got going on. So that's a uh, that's a pretty cool legacy. You have seen a lot of that world change, too. It's gotten a lot easier to oh, get online yes. and do a live show now. Yes, it has. I remember back in the days of, of Google Hangouts, that was the, the way yeah. you had to do it. It would take me 30 to 45 minutes to set up a show every night. Now we do it in five or yeah. less, you know, it, it's very simple now. And we went through a time where we wanted to broadcast on on Facebook and YouTube, and I was spending tons of money getting computers built, trying out programs that was eight nine $900 to make it work, and then boom, all of a sudden this stuff come up, 
and it was free. Yeah. They do do everything yeah. that I was trying to do, and that's what we done. But um, yeah, the the um, cameras that we use now are far superior than the sixty seven six seventies that I started out with. Uh, these nine twenties and and better quality stuff now. Um, you don't have to have microphones. Of course, we've got microphones and uh, pop filters and all kinds of stuff. Now, we never had nothing like that when we started out. We had a, a uh, I think it's a 670. I still got it around here someplace. I used for a backup, a webcam, and it had a built-in microphone, and that that was as good as it got in those days. We didn't know anything about any of this other stuff. The, 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 the way that we do it broadcast now compared to what it was seven years ago is so much easier and the higher quality. Of course, when we started this, I lived way out in the country and I had very poor quality internet service, but it's all there was. And now yeah. I've got lightning fast internet. And yeah. uh, if there's something that's going on that's not working right, most of the time, it's not on my end. Yeah. And it is amazing. You gave me my first break on a live show here on YouTube. And uh, I remember just then because you were doing it in Hangouts. And you had to have the program. And then it was some finagling to get everything in the right place. And yep. and I consider myself halfway tech savvy. So I can't imagine what it's like with somebody who's not that tech savvy. Yeah, kind of I would. All the, and... Uh, you know, now it's it's really, really a lot easier to make stuff work. Make stuff I will happen. tell you how hard it was for me when we started. When I bought Chris as part of the show out, he done a video for me showing me exactly how to do Hangouts and make the show work. Yeah. And I would sit there in the through the week and practice doing that. So when show night come, I'd be able to do it without messing up and still messed up. <laughs> well, in Lyle's crystal ball, this will be one of the crystal ball questions. Uh, where do you see Catfish Weekly going and also just some of the live content shows? Uh, because there's more players. Palmetto Cats is in. Uh, Chucky Cats and a bunch of other people do nightly live fishing stuff several days a week. I even get on there occasionally and do some live stuff. Uh, what's Lyle's crystal ball for Catfish Weekly? And down the road, what would you like to see coming out in the content world? Well, I hope to be doing Catfish Weekly. I, I always said if I made it to 65, I would be ready to step down. As it is now, I am having so much fun. If my health is still good, I may go on a year or two after that. But there's going to be a time in the next five or six years or less that I'll, I'll be turning it over to somebody because yeah. I don't want to be doing it uh, when I'm too old. People don't care what you say or think, you know, and that <laughs> happens when you get to a certain age. People don't care what you think. I may be there now, but I hope not. But, yeah, um, yeah uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I thought one of my my boys would end up doing it, but they got lives and things of their own that they do, and they don't seem to be interested in it. So we'll we'll get a good guy to do it. Maybe James Smith, somebody like that, would, would be good to do it. James and I really hit it off really well. Uh, Doc and I hit it off really well. So uh, hopefully we can make something like that happen. Um, as far as um, the other part of your question, I see technology growing, getting better all the time. I don't ever see that slowing up at this point. I think that you're going to see, um, you're going to have to see tournaments take a three fish or less limit on waters that have big fish. You're going to have to. They're losing too many. And people are, one of the biggest complaints that I see in the tournament area is people dropping fish and weigh in on live weigh ins. And they just, they go crazy about that. But I got to tell you, everybody drops one once in a while. Okay. It'll happen. It's just it will happen. Of, they'll twist yeah. out of your hand. Mm -hmm. They bite down on you when you least expect it. Things happen and people need to understand that. But if it's the same guy over and over and over and over doing it, um, 
then maybe they should get uh, one of the things I think they all should get is uh, um, sacks to put them in. Wasteland. Kind of like, yeah. I yeah. think that would be a good deal for weighing, weighing, getting big fish in and out of boats. I've seen them drop uh, out of boats onto asphalt for, and that's that. Them fish never survive. I don't believe. Uh, I see that getting better. Um, I see people wising up to some of the the uh, people that are in the industry now that think they know more than they do um, with the technology that we have and people visiting among each other. Uh, it's becoming pretty prevalent to me that, that there's a lot of guys out there that think they know more than they do. And, and it's becoming more, uh, pop, people are finding out more about that all along. I think right now and, and will be to come, one of the hottest things going is people doing live streams while they're fishing and it doesn't seem to matter Dieter if they're catching fish or not if they're visiting with people right. and can carry on an intelligent intelligent conversation and people like them they do well yeah. chunky El Stan Perez does a wonderful job he catches fish he's very personable he's funny he gets so excited that's people love to see that. Kevin uh, is another one. Palmetto cats. He come into the world of catfishing what a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. For a long time, he was just catching little cats. Now he's catching some bigger ones. But he'll go live and he'll keep people entertained. He has a a uh, prayer factor about him, and I don't mean any disrespect by that whatsoever. But I think people are attracted to it. I would absolutely, never, absolutely. I would have never changed that. Yeah, he uh, he changed the game, raised the bar, whatever you want to call it, in the live in our niche in the live broadcast of what he's doing. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I always said, man, if I if I was going to do a live show, you know, something regularly, that's what I would want to do. I like yeah. the way he does it. You mentioned the the tournament world and what's going on. <sighs> And I'm probably skipping way fast forward here because we're not even to the point where what I've been preaching about live streaming catfish tournaments. I think the tournaments, especially the bigger tournaments, have been missing a major marketing opportunity I agree. by doing these poorly done live broadcasts. I think there's they're leaving a lot of meat on the bone in that that area there as far as marketing dollars go. But do you think there's ever going to be a time where we have a different tournament format and what i'm getting at is here is what you talked about on the show the other day with the uh catfish uh the channel cat deal that that uh rinse and repeat deal where people would catch fish bring them in and go catch more it's a great format I think uh, so you, too. Look, you look at what they're doing in the bass fishing world with uh uh the uh major league fishing the way they do their format i love that format it's 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 entertaining to watch. It makes a tournament entertaining to watch. Right now, our format is, you know, and most people know, some may not that are new to this world, but you go out in the morning and you have a big blast off and it's a great, beautiful display. And then you come back eight or nine hours later and you have a weigh in for a little bit. And it's kind of a whole lot of nothing in between. Can you ever see us getting to the point in the catfish world to where there is more of maybe some type of live deal, something that's kind of a little more entertaining to watch? Because it's hard to make a fishing tournament entertaining for spectators, but those spectators are the ones that bring in advertising dollars and higher right. payouts and all that kind of work. Can you ever see us doing that, especially – with technology leveling the playing field in this, uh, you know, compared to like the world of bass fishing. If they could come up with a format for catfishing like major league fishing, I think with the size of catfish being caught today it would take over the fishing industry. Just my opinion. But there is a couple of things that goes on. I'm sure you're aware of my buddy Chad Fields and James Dockery to do a show on Thursday night before our Pan Fish Nation show. It's really not about fishing. It's about comedy. They do a very good job. Uh, I enjoy watching them boys a lot. I'll be with them both this weekend. But what Chad Fields come up with was an online tournament throughout the COVID uh, 
months and it worked really well where everybody was live and he was the hub and everything run through him. I thought that was an excellent idea. He was the first one that I know of to done mm -hmm. that done it and it was extremely successful. I, I applaud him for that. And I think that that could be a great format along with another one, which my buddy Mark does from uh, Catfish and Crappie, where he does a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you and I was talking uh, talking about doing one of them one-on-ones where I was going to use some type of whatever you want. And you were going to do want. fish. <laughs> I'm breaking chicken. the chicken. <laughs> We need to set that up. Now, win, lose, or draw, that's going to be fun. Yeah, it yeah, really is. But, um, you know, I think that's a great format. But the one Chad come up. Now, uh, Brian Bortz and uh, Jeremy uh, Creole Catfishing done done that a couple of times. They had high viewership, high viewership. Of course, they're both clowns. They, they, they make you laugh. Brian said out there. In the, yeah. Ryan sat yeah. out there in the rain all day and got beat up. But what happened? They've done another one, you know, and yeah. that's that's two good guys doing it for the right reasons. Uh, yeah, exactly. you know, they're doing it for the right reasons. And I think that was Chad's deal. If the coronavirus thing would have kept people in another year, Chad's deal would have exploded. Yeah, it really would have. Well, as if you don't have enough on your plate, you started Panfish Weekly. What the heck were you thinking uh, when you decided to do that? I love catching bluegill. Um, a lot of people, in, in, including me, like and enjoy very much catching crappie. Um, I like to eat crappie. I would rather catch bluegill. Pound for pound, them and channel cat are probably two of the hardest fighting fish in our waters. And you can go through videos on YouTube and there's more panfish type stuff and more successful than anything. And nobody was talking about it. So here I am throwing my hat at another ghost that I may or may not have should left alone. But Panfish Nation has taken off in a few months. Um, we had Babe Winkleman on as our first show guest. Yeah, hey, I was kind of hating on you when I heard that, because uh, that's like that's that's a big name. I mean, that's that transcends yeah. just that little niche. I mean, that's a big fishy name that's very broad. Yeah, we had him and and a couple of other big names, uh, but but Babe Winkleman is America's hero in the fishing world. You know, there's Bill Dance and Babe Winkleman and a few guys like that in the world of fishing that's everybody's homeboy and I've had them both on shows of ours and, and I'm very blessed to, to make that happen. And babe, I've, he is his most down to earth guy when you're talking to him, not on camera as anyone you will yeah. ever meet. Have you found that pretty true about a lot of people in the fishing industry? I, have. I gotta tell you when you and I know each other for a lot of years, and when we first met at the catfish conference, it's just like I'd known you my whole life. Yeah, yeah, and and there's yeah, people you, that are like kind of, that. Yeah. Luke yeah. Kinges, the first time I met him, he's a little chunky kid, and we went up to fish Cats Incredible up north, and he walked yeah. up and he said, Mr. Stokes, he said, I've got something for you. I said, what's that? He said, frogs. I said, do I need them? <laughs> he said, yes, you do. I said, that'll be great. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. And the next thing I know, Luke Hinges is doing live feeds for hours on end at night. Yep. And I've been there watching him. And he he just, you know, him and them guys from Northwood Angling do a bang up job. They do. Great job. Great show. They put some really great cinematic stuff together. Absolutely. And I wish they would do more of it. I hate that they're yeah. not cranking out as much stuff as they used to because they do some Really, really good stuff. So now, it's Panfish Nation, right? Yeah, it started out as Panfish Weekly, and I thought that was too confusing that I okay. changed the name of it. <clears throat> cool. cool. And that's on YouTube. Is it also on yes. Facebook? Or, okay. No, just sure. on YouTube. Cool. Just on I, YouTube. I got to notice, and if you look at some of these guys that are doing what I tried to do and have it on Facebook and YouTube, 
either you got a following on Facebook or you got a following on YouTube that you don't get big followings on both. Yeah, and uh, some of that has to do with the way Facebook basically sets those deals up. They want you to buy sponsored yep. content, basically, and they'll give you a little bit and then they'll snatch it away from you and they really throttle back who it's actually put out there to. Like you said, you have to have a very good developed following to let them know that all that stuff's available. So That's right. Uh, I watched uh, I watched Kevin's show the other night and he had a big following on YouTube and I think he had five people at the most that I ever seen on Facebook and I've been following a lot of those guys that are doing both and uh, one guy I watched the other night had a big following on Facebook. Two people was all I ever seen on YouTube. Yeah. So it's one or the other. Yeah. All right. We'll close it out with this. Where are you getting ready to go to? What you got going on? I know you, you're chasing some channel cats I, and there's some stuff in Quincy. Tell us about that. Well, first off, this weekend we are headed to Mendota Lake uh, in, in uh, Wisconsin, up in Madison, Wisconsin. And the last time I was up there, I caught a 29-pound channel cat. I'm hoping to best that this time, but you know how what my odds are at that. But we are going to be up there with a whole bunch of people trying to catch those giant channel cat. I'm going to sneak off one day because I was told the other day that they have some monster bluegill in, in Mendota Lake and not Cherokee. And I'm going to the weed patch and going to try to jerk some of them out. You know, <laughs> if I'm going that far, I might as well go get my bang for my buck. Yep. Uh, and then coming up, I've got a uh, uh, a tournament that I'm going to go up and do some broadcasting with. And we may or may not fish the tournament in Kansas City with Tim Berger's All-American Catfish. And then the following weekend, we'll be um, uh, fishing for freedom in Quincy, Illinois. Well, tell us about Fishing for Freedom, because that is something, depending on when somebody listens to this podcast or sees it, uh, that goes on every year. And every year. Uh, tell us a little about that. Fishing for Freedom, I believe, started 10 years ago, and I believe this will be the eighth or ninth year that we've been to it. Um, a boater goes up and gives four hours of his time to take a current military personnel, a retired military personnel, someone that might have a disability that's been in the military, but somebody that served our country out for four hours in their boat and try to give them a good time. These are the most thankful people. They don't care if they catch fish or not. They want to be a part of what this organization is doing. These people, if you own a boat or if you're military and you're more than uh, an hour away from Quincy, Illinois, they'll put you up in a motel for a couple of nights and feed you two or three times. And they have trap shooting and archery shooting and all kinds of stuff for these heroes to do. And that's what they are. They're heroes. They're my heroes, at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's the most satisfying thing I've ever been a part of. Um, hopefully my boat will run. Uh, it's set for two years. So I've been working hard to get ready to go because this is an important thing for Cindy and I. We go every year and, and we have a blast up there and I usually do a um, a broadcast from that area and I've been asked to do one this year. Um, I was asked to do the uh, missing man table ceremony speech last year in Dieter. Um, I couldn't hold together. I come apart like I've never come apart in my life and um, I considered it an embarrassment to myself, but the people that was there tell me that uh, it was very heartfelt and they appreciated that I give it my all to do that. But if you've ever done that, if you never have, you try to get through that, it's pretty hard hard to do. And um, uh, the, this, this is uh, the most important thing that we do in the fishing world every year. Yeah. And that brings me to my last question. You do these things for these organizations, these tournaments, you know, volunteer your time. Uh, when, when you're done with Catfish Weekly and, and you, you hang up your microphone, uh, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want people to look back on Lyle Stokes? And what do you want that legacy to be? What do you want to be remembered for? Just trying to help people catch more fish. 
I got honored at the Fishing for Freedom tournament last year, was surprised. Um, they give Cindy and I a plaque for all the stuff that we'd done up there. Um, that more than made up for what we'd done there. But it just as far, I just want people to say, hey, the guy done his best to try to help people catch more fish. Well, I can say this. Uh, you've helped me a bunch in everything I've done in you know the YouTube world so far. And I, I think if we ever have a Catfish Hall of Fame, uh, you're probably going to be in that initial party that they induct. Because, yeah, I think your legacy is going to be it's going to be one of, you know, it's going to be a good one. I hope that my legacy in the end, when I'm done in the fishing world, will be what yours is. And I'm as known and looked at the way you are. So I appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you, everything you do. Thank you, Deidre. You're just too kind to me. And, uh, you know, what you do uh, is so important to help people uh, because you not, you not only show them how to catch fish, you explain to them how to do that. And uh, I'm going to throw my hat at that a couple of times and see how it works out. But um, your videos are awesome. And, and um, I hope this podcast stuff works out well for you. Yep. You're, uh, you're going to be my first one as having a, a guest in the video podcast, which uh, podcast, which I think uh, for some people are going to like it. Some people, it may be too much jaw jacking, but uh, I think it fits a... Uh, I think it fits a good little niche out there. I know I like watching some of these video podcasts that are out uh, outside of the fishing world. And uh, the reaction to what I put out last week, which I didn't have a guest like you on, uh, was pretty good. So I appreciate you being the premier one. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But thanks again. Thank you, Dieter. If there's ever anything I can do for you, you know where I'm at. Well, there you go, guys. It was an honor to have Lyle on here uh, doing this last minute before he headed out of town. Uh, he's a, uh, like I said, I think his legacy in this sport uh, will be profound. And I, I, I just have no idea how many lives he's touched with what he's done uh, through the show, how many people he's helped, uh, how many people he's made better fishermen and uh, made better people with the contents that he's put out. And uh, kind of set the bar. Uh, initially for what needed to be done and a bunch of other people have come along but uh he's still trudging it out and cranking it out and i hope he's around longer than he plans to be because uh we love having him and i love listening every monday night again he's on monday night 8 p.m here on youtube check him out and uh that's it for now guys uh we'll try to get one of these out next week uh but until then we'll catch you out on the water well folks if you made it this far thank you for watching here are a couple more videos that I think you're going to like. I'd watch that one and then that one. No, no do, do that one first and then that one. I, I don't know. Just watch them both. They're both good.